Hello, I'm Mokar Rizvi, and this is Scope. We're going to start off today's show by discussing coronavirus, or COVID-19, as it's also known. Uh, we are very much in the midst of a second wave, even a third wave, in some countries, such as Iran as well, who have been very hard hit uh, by the pandemic. Also, um, at this time, there's talk of a number of different vaccines that are being tested. Some are doing very well, according to the numbers that have come out, the statistics that have come out. We have Pfizer, we have Moderna, uh, we even have a Russian vaccine, and possibly a number of other vaccines in the works as well. There are some discrepancies in the numbers there as well. And all of that we will, of course, discuss about, of course, how successful or not those vaccines will be. Then there are concerns about, you know, how these vaccines will be distributed once uh, and if they are finalized and are fully successful in the ongoing trials that need to occur in the different stages before a vaccine is released to the general public. How will that work? Because of certainly uh, the pandemic has proven, if anything, that all of us are so interdependent and affect each other in, in ways um, that we may not have previously realized or appreciated that this then is of course a concern for the entire globe that if there is a pandemic or the pandemic still continuing in one part of the world that will certainly affect others in the other parts of the world as well in some fashion. Let's discuss all of that a bit further. I'm joined by Dr. Mohamed Monir, who is a virologist. He's a lecturer in biomedicine at Lancaster University. He's joining us today from Lancaster. Joining us this morning from Farmington, Connecticut is Dr. Daria Unagmaz, who is a professor of immunology at Jackson Laboratory at the University of Connecticut's Medical School. Uh, Daria and Mohamed, thank you both for your time today uh, to speak to us here in in scope. Uh, Daria, let me start with you. Um, what do you make uh, of the current wave that we're, we're in right now around the world um, and how we've gotten to this point, right? So we've had, of course, some countries taking, I think it's Sweden that's taken the, the approach that we're going to get herd immunity that hasn't really worked. Others have been a lot stricter. Um, is it simply down to the fact that people have not been following a standard operating procedures? Is that why we're very much still in the second wave? Yeah, exactly that. I mean, this virus is extremely infectious. Uh, we've we've known that uh, since the beginning. And I think uh, during summer, um, you know, there was quite a bit of relaxation in many countries, particularly the Europe, U.S., and in some countries uh, in Asia as well. And I think um, we're we're seeing the result of that. But I think another important factor is that the weather is is gotten cold and. Uh, we know that the virus really spreads indoors, uh, so um, uh, people uh, spend more time indoors in restaurants and, and cafes and other places. Um, so those are uh, primary uh, locations for for the spread. And I think uh, the second wave is hitting very hard. Um, a number of countries had to close down. Um, they had to because their their healthcare system were beginning to collapse. Uh, I think we still have another couple of months of very very difficult time. Uh, and Mohammed, what, what are your thoughts about how we've, again, gotten ourselves to this point and, and what's to come then, right? Because there's, there's a lot of hope, certainly, in the air about the vaccines that we're all discussing, 70 plus percent, you know, success rates, um, you know, at least from what my layman's understanding of, of that. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think important thing uh, here is that we have been, you know, suffering for last uh, 10 to 11 months. And now we are having uh, hope in the tunnel with very good vaccine. Um, not only one, but two or three vaccines running very fast and soon we will have the approval and deployment in the field. So now I think the critical time, I think important than ever before is to really make sure that the spread of this infection can be um, minimized to the extent we can by uh, not traveling, by opening the windows, ventilating the houses, and to make sure that the interpersonal co connection is uh, minimum. Because doing so, we will be having more time to get those people immunized, which otherwise would be has come to the infection. Uh, Derya, if we're completely honest, I know none of us, none of the panelists today are political experts necessarily, but the politics has affected um, the realities on the ground, hasn't it? Uh, it certainly has, uh, at least in the U.S. Uh, as you know, the, there were elections uh, no one before, it, and uh, um, a lot of uh, missteps before that, and uh, much pressure on on companies to produce the vaccines before the elections. Uh, but uh, but also, you know, um, the Trump administration was not. Uh, very um, careful in trying to control the virus and, and uh, you know, wearing masks and, and so on. And, and they really promoted uh, treatments that had uh, no, no effect whatsoever, such as hydroxychloroquine. Um, uh, I think uh, politics definitely played a role uh, in some countries for the good, in some countries for the bad, unfortunately. 
Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Because you know you're sitting in the UK, and I know I know that in the UK as well, very much now that there are lockdowns in effect, or there's some easing. I, I I've heard in certain areas. Um, uh, I, I don't, again, I want to go into a very deep political conversation, but do you think that there wasn't an appreciation about what to do early on? Was it simply a fact that um, doctors were not being listened to? Is it as simple as just saying that? Absolutely. I think not only in the UK, but I think around the world, there has been a quite a lot of political influence onto the decision making. And probably that is one of the reasons that we didn't really manage to put the restriction at the right time uh, for such an infectious disease and delaying any single day, meaning that you are uh, contributing thousands of more infection into the, the overall bad situation. And those thousand will let, lead to 10,000 and so on. For example, taking into the perspective of the United Kingdom here, I mean, we knew that the R rate is increasing substantially, um, but the lockdown has been um, after two weeks, after a hard conversation between the politicians, hard conversation between the researcher and the advisory board. So uh, once the lockdown was implemented, of course, the, the R rate started to go down, and now we have 1.1 to 1.2, which is significantly lower than what it has been before. But if the lockdown would have been implemented two weeks before when the number were exponentially increasing, that would have certainly a positive knock-on effect onto the overall number of cases. But it wasn't practiced just pr primarily because it was a political decision, but based on the scientific around it, it was fully justified. Hmm. Right, there, there, yeah. Let's talk about the vaccines, and if, if we may, in, in in greater detail, because and I don't want to go into them, you know, step by step, or each single one of them. But um, how much hope? Should, should all of us have that these vaccines will be out very soon? And I, I know that's a very general statement to make, but are we seeing this happening? You know, because there's even been talk, I believe, on the Trump administration's part about this being, you know, vaccines being ready even by December of this year itself. Yes, I, I think, you know, I, I, I can tell as, a, as an immunologist that this is really a remarkable advance, um, a, really a victory for, for science and for mankind, because you know, considering that uh, this is a new virus, um, uh, that the vaccines usually take three, four years to develop, and uh, this the, the development period was cut down to six months. Uh, new technologies, both BioNTech and uh, Moderna vaccines, are using this mRNA vaccines, which are showing remarkable efficacy. You know, we weren't even expecting uh, 70, 80 percent, but they're they're reporting 95 percent protection, which is as good as gets uh, for a vaccine. I mean, the the best vaccine in the world right now is measles vaccine, which is about 95 percent uh, protection. Uh, so that that uh, that rate might go down as as time passes, but uh, it, it's really remarkable to have um, you know two different companies using same technology, having same protection. Uh, AstraZeneca just uh, announced that they have at least uh, 70 percent, probably more uh, protection rate. Uh, Russians have a vaccine that looks very promising, and uh, Johnson & Johnson, Novavax, and other companies, Chinese, are developing their own. So it, it, this, this, is, this is really uh, quite, uh, quite remarkable, and I think uh, it's really the, end, uh, the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, because uh, by, if we are able to vaccinate a significant portion of the population, uh, this pandemic will, will stop. Uh, and I'm hoping by sometime uh, middle of next year, uh, sometime uh, 2021 summer. Hmm. Uh, Mohammed, you know, the, the, the concern has been uh, on the part of many that, that, that things would be sped up too much, right, when it came to the proper process uh, that needs to be followed for these vaccines to be approved by, by respective governments and by doctors around the world. Uh, do you think that has happened? Do you think that proper process has been followed? Uh, or should we be concerned that because of pressures and, of course, you know, the very realistic pressures that were placed on these companies, that this may have been sped up too much? Uh, thank you very much, Bukhar, for asking this question, because this is something that is of concern not only for the general public, but also in the scientific community, that the vaccine that go into the human arms is rigorously tested and is rubber stamped onto the safety, if not the efficacy. So putting into the perspective for any vaccines to be developed and come into the market is 10 to 15 year process. But most of the time has been wasted onto bureaucracy, onto um, politics, onto doing the paperwork. But this time what happened is that we have an advan advantage of existing technologies, technologies that have already been uh, used in the field. For example, AstraZeneca, Johnson Johnson, Sputnik V, Sinovac, all these based on the vectors, those were already available and the platform and the technologies were there. So they only have to repurpose it quickly and in relatively very short time to bring into the phase one and phase two trial. 
And what happened this time, probably first time in the history, is that we have cut short time onto uh, phase one to phase three trials, uh, because there is always a, a room for uh, overlapping phase one and phase two trial, which hasn't been practiced before in that detail. So that has helped the time really to reduce into uh, the time. For example, now we have only eight to nine months when we have the vaccines at 95 percent efficacy. So this is certainly a powerhouse for the for, for the biomedical research. But at the same time, I don't really think that any of the vaccine has caught any corner. So um, I, I don't really doubt on if the data would be approved by the FDA in the United States or HMRA here in the UK or MA. Uh, MRA for, um, for for the European Union because they got loads of experience in approving site type of pharmaceuticals. So if it is approved by these regulatory bodies, I don't think there would be any concerns on the safety and efficacy going into the public. Okay, so then there, yeah, you know, then there's the the huge issue, right, of distribution. How does that even work? I mean, I know I know that's not you know down to doctors themselves to do that, but certainly that must be of concern about how exactly this is to be distributed. What um, lockdown measures will still need to be in effect for those countries who have not yet gotten the vaccines? I mean, this is a huge, complex issue, certainly, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, it's not just a distribution, but also production. I mean, uh, what happened was uh, the, these companies started to produce these vaccines long before they knew that the, they, they would work or not. I mean, the, the U.S. government actually uh, supported this with billions of dollars uh, uh, of taxpayer money that, you know, in case it worked, uh, we should have the vaccines ready. If they didn't, they would go to the uh, trash can, of course. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, at least two companies have shown positive results, and so they have uh, for example, BioNTech will have about uh, um, you know enough to immunize 20 million people, about 50 million doses by the end of the year, because they have been producing these vaccines, uh, and by uh, next year they will ha produce uh, about a billion dose each. Uh, companies, uh, AstraZeneca said they can produce about three billion. But then the next issue is exactly what you're uh, asking, which is a logistical nightmare because. Uh, in particular, these new mRNA vaccines uh, have to be kept in, in uh, sub-freezing uh, um, fr temperatures. Uh, BioNTech uh, uh, vaccine has to be kept in minus uh, 170 degrees, which is, uh, you know, a special freezer is required for that, although, you know, you can keep them about five days in normal refrigerators. Um, transporting them has to be in dry ice or special uh, containers. Uh, I, I believe uh, United Arab Emirates have some uh, quite remarkable um, uh, logistical um, uh, support for that. Uh, they've, they've been talking about being a hub for this. Uh, Moderna vaccine uh, is, is minus 20 degrees, so that, that will be relatively um, easier to transport and, and store. Uh, other vaccines don't require that. Uh, they still need uh, distribution. Um, you know, things like even the, uh, the needles yep. to inject the vaccines were, yep. are in short supply. So you have to make sure all of those are ready and, and actually then you apply to the people. So it's going to take time. It, it won't happen overnight. Uh, that's why I'm thinking the next six months will be the, sure. the distribution vaccination period. Mad, I'll give you the final word, just under a minute if you can. Uh, what are your thoughts about distribution, about the, you know, the challenges ahead regarding that? Yes, uh, I think there are certainly challenges, as Ria has mentioned, but I think those challenges are even more in the developing world than in the developed world. For example, here in the UK, we have a population of 70 million, and the government already made the contract for 355 million doses. So I'm not really worried about the developed world. The developing world has a lot of more challenges because even for those established vaccines like polio, measles, we are not being able to deliver those one to every corner in the developing world developing world and affordability is another thing those uh, for example Pfizer and Moderna they cost 20 to 37 dollar per dose which is certainly a significant amount of money when it comes to low and middle income countries so the challenges are in the developing world and as we've been saying we have to immunize every part in the in the whole world before we can start resting onto the pandemic very well uh, we'll leave that that very uh, pertinent point but we do sincerely appreciate doctors Mohammed Munir and Derya Unutnaz for their time today uh, and for sharing of course their, their expert insight on this because you know for a lot of us when we're looking at um, what's happening now around the world and I, I, I'm honing in on Iran again because we're having a third wave there and it's been an incredibly bad situation in that country certainly as the case study for other countries around the world nevertheless there have been countries that have done very well that have locked down have been very strict such as New Zealand for example also has done fairly well um, on 
record about this COVID-19 pandemic. And the politics is also very, very important. Donald Trump, uh, Jair Bolsonaro of Israel, uh, all those doubts that were cast into people's minds about how really even serious this virus was to begin with. Um, then, of course, there's the talk of the vaccinations. How quickly will all that come out? How well are those tests or, or those trials going at this time? It seems to be all going very, very well. Uh, so it seems at this point in time that everything's optimistic, but then the final hurdle will always remain distribution. And as Mohammed there said right at the end, the main issue will be, yes, the developing countries. Um, and will they get um, their share of these vaccines? Because again, this affects all of us. So if any part of the world has it, as Mohammed there mentioned as well, it affects even the developed world also. I'll be back with the next segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Wakar Vizvi. In this segment, we're going to discuss France. Um, there are three pieces of legislation that are currently uh, being debated in the country. Uh, one of them is, in fact, already passed in, in the first uh, step for it to go forward, and, that, and that's the National Assembly. Now, the three pieces of this legislation, respectively, would, in a sense, really limit academic and press freedoms, as well as all also possibly censor uh, criticism of public officials. Now, the law which limits press freedoms, known as the security law, has already been passed, as I said, by the National Assembly and human rights organizations have protested on the ground as well about that. All of this seemingly is coming in the wake of those attacks that France has suffered, um, uh, you know, which France has gone then very strongly against seemingly its own Muslim citizens. And certainly France has had a hard time for a while now with its own citizens who are of minority backgrounds and or of different faiths and ethnicities. Let's discuss all of that a bit further. And I'm joined by Dr. Louise George Tin, who is uh, the Prime Minister of the State of the African Diaspora. He's also the President of the French Black Coalition. He's joining us today from the French capital, Paris. Also joining us from Paris is Ami Visika Dokbolo, who is pursuing a master's in sociology and management. Um, and also joining us, in fact, from the French capital is Dr. Nasira Gwena Sonyamas, who is an anthropologist, sociologist, and professor at Université Paris. Wheat. Uh, Nasira, Amivi Sika, and Louise George, thank you to all three of you for your time today. Um, Louise George, let me let me start with you, if I may. Uh, what do you make, firstly, let's if we go step by step, of the security law, right? So the concerns are within this security law, essentially there's there's you know, there's no room to, to, in fact, even hold police accountable, right? Because you can't even release their images, you can't take video images of them or photographs of them. What are your thoughts? Yes, to be honest, we have in France a very serious problem with respect and discrimination and racism. And the Muslim community is exposed to this kind of racism regularly. So, of course, many Muslim people are associated with terrorism in the eyes of many French leaders. So, of course, when you are Muslim, you are jeopardized, and that is a serious problem. And that law, and French people say, oh, it's okay to not only to criticize religions, which is fine, but also to insult religions and insult God. And that is, according to me, rather shocking. So they say that's freedom of speech. But according to me, any freedom has some kind of limitation. And also, it's clear that the government does not support freedom of speech or freedom of expression because this law you are talking about makes it impossible for anybody to make a video about the police, even if the police is making brutality. So it's clear that freedom of speech depends on your origin, the situation, mm. or your religion. So it's not really fair. I don't say uh, that it is a dictatorship, but we are going into a very, I mean, uh, difficult uh, direction. Yeah. We are not really in, in um, a democracy. So even the European Union is, uh, has decided to warn France about their law. So it's yeah. not only the Muslim countries that criticize France. Even many other countries in the world do criticize France, but France is so arrogant. They believe they are the country of human rights. Hmm. When in fact we have a country, we are the country that has committed more crimes against humanity than anybody right. else. Uh, Amivi Sika, what, what are your thoughts about, about press freedoms, academic freedoms? I mean, this sort of goes against what France claims about itself, right? As uh, Louis Georges there just mentioned, um, France is meant to be a country of freedoms, of rights, but this seems to be going opposite. Yes. Uh, 
you know, we are known as the, um, the country of human rights, the country of freedom. And now we have this situation, like, I don't understand because, you know, um, if we, if French people voted for Macron um, a few years ago, it was to block the rise of the extreme right um, uh, party. But now we are discovering day after day that uh, the government of Macron is like uh, extreme right wing government. Now we are losing our rights and... Um, even if the Amnesty International or the Independent Defender of Rights said that this law is not a good law, that, that they are against this law, the government and the president still, uh, still, do, still do this. So I don't understand. I'm really sad that my country is becoming, um, becoming a country who lose the, this right. Sita, what are your thoughts on that? Because, you know, uh, I know we've spoken about this, this sort of thing before as well with you, about the, the, the response that would come after those attacks. Uh, have we gone very extreme in the opposite direction where uh, in response to these attacks and in response to the narrative and perception that has been built in people's minds that it is now okay to do all of these things? Um, actually, I would say that uh, even before uh, the attacks on uh, our colleague professor in uh, northern Paris, um, there, has, there is this trend uh, of uh, the French state to uh, focus more and more on uh, a police order, on uh, control of uh, not only speeches, unlike what it says about uh, defending uh, freedom of speech, which is not the case at all in France right now, as uh, louis George was just uh, explaining. And so for that matter, I think that we should look back all the way to the colonial times when France was ruling under a specific kind of laws, um, laws of exception, laws of emergency, and this is precisely the kind of state that we are in right now. We have been under the emergency law for three years, and there are no way and no sign that we would get out of it uh, in the close future. And I think this speaks very much to the spirit of the French state and, and the, the, the different French government. Actually, it's not a matter of left or right. Um, Whichever government you consider for the past 20 years, and especially for the last 10 years and uh, five years, there has been this strong tendency towards control, towards surveillance, toward, towards narrowing uh, the space of expression, and especially having this kind of double standard mm. in which uh, certain people are allowed very uh, to be very vocal about uh, special issues, especially religion, for example, and, and the defense of laicite. And on the other hand, you would have people who are supposed to remain silent or yeah. righteously be silenced. So I think that this law uh, translates that uh, into uh, the body of law of, uh, of the French state. But actually, this hasn't been implemented for years. Mm. George, I, I wonder what you make of, of then the issue of, um, if I'm saying it correctly, Islamo-Gauchism, which is in French means Islamo-leftism. And that's been something that, that's been spoken of right by, by a, a French minister as well. I believe it's the interior minister and the education minister. And there, this is more about academic freedoms then that in universities, you know, there is this Islamo-leftist, um, you know, a lean uh, within academia. Is that a fair um, uh, accusation? How concerning is that for you? Yes, if you say that uh, people shouldn't discriminate against Muslim people, then you are, yes, an Islamo-Gauchist, which is a kind of insult. And even the main organization fighting against Islamophobia, then they had to leave France because they were jeopardized. And the Minister of Home Affairs said he needed to destroy this organization and to make it illegal. And there's nothing, I mean, there is no judgment. He didn't have to go to court. The guy himself, he's accused of rape uh, by some women. But this organization that was never accused of anything, they, was, they were never sent to court. But they were about to be destroyed by the minister. 
on administrative reason. So they had to go away. They said it's impossible for us to defend Muslim people in these conditions. So they had to go away. And I think that's quite a shame for this country. So mm. another organization defending Muslim people was destroyed uh, yesterday. So I don't know where we're going, but it's not good. It reminds us of other times. And yes, today, yeah. um, it's impossible even to speak of Islamophobia, which is a reality. Mm. But of course, if you say that there is Islamophobia in this country, it means you are almost a terrorist. Yeah. So yeah. the situation and freedom of speech is, of course, not real. It depends mm. on your color, on your mm. religion. Exactly. And, uh, and we cannot accept this situation. And I'm glad I, that I'm, people... I apologize for interrupting you, Louis George. I, we just have two minutes left, so I wanted to give Amik, Amivi Sika and Nasira their final comments. Um, Amivi Sika, if you can tell us in under a minute, you know, certainly it's not just Muslims in France who are affected by, by what's happening, right? It's people of color. It's even normal French citizens. Should this not concern everybody who is French? Yes, it concerns everybody. And, you know, um, normally the the, the, home, the home secretary, the interior minister of France, um, you know, he has to protect us. So, yes, he has to work with the police. But I think he can found his role and he think he has to be the lawyer of the police or, you know, the minister of the police. So he always um, defend the police and deny what uh, they like the violence that police make uh, um, mm. on people. So that's the problem, I think, because uh, the minister, the government does yeah. don't see that we are that we are always victim of violence. Mm. They they deny it. That's why they they choose to you know yeah. ban the video because they want to erase the problem than to resolve the problem. Indeed. And as, as a final word then, uh, you know, do you think French society will take all of this and just accept this? I mean, is that the way we're going right now? There's some sort of a, a, an awakening uh, in the wake precisely of a terrorist attack, but also on uh, the attacks on, on uh, freedom rights and fundamental rights in, in France. And I think that what, what is appearing quite clearly now to the eye of the public is the fact that the state, the French state, is part of the problem and certainly not part of the solution by the way that it is... Uh, not only destroying fundamental rights, but considering that it's its own right to do so. I mean, uh, the French state right now feels completely uh, in some sort of impunity with the way it is uh, ruling the state and uh, dismissing any kind of uh, yeah. demonstration, any kind of expression that opposes its own power. Very well. There's a final word, but we do sincerely appreciate all three of our guests for their time. Um, all of them have busy schedules, so we appreciate them sharing their insight with us. That was Dr. Nasira Gwenef Sulimas, who is speaking to us there from Paris. Uh, she was joined by Amivi Sika Dogbolo, who was also speaking to us from the French capital, and Dr. Louise Georges Tin, who was speaking to us also from Paris. All of them sharing their thoughts on where exactly freedoms as a whole within France are going. So these are talking, we're talking about freedoms such as academic freedoms, the freedom to debate all issues within universities whether you are uh, on the left or the right, wherever you may stand on any issue, universities are meant to be places uh, of free exchanges of ideas. And then there's, of course, the huge issue of the security law and how it treats the press and the right of the press to hold accountable public officials, especially those who are law enforcement officers, uh, and how exactly they deal with the general public. There have been con concerns uh, in France, not just of how France treats its Muslim citizens, but also its people of color, and as well as others of other ethnicities and faiths as well. This is a very slippery slope and should concern every single French citizen, regardless of their background, faith, or ethnicity. I'll be back with my final segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here in Scope with me, Okara Vizmi. In this segment, we're going to discuss the Open Skies Treaty, or the Treaty on Open Skies, actually, is the official name. The U.S. has formally withdrawn from that. It had begun the process uh, around six months ago. Um, this treaty includes 34 participating nations um, where they are allowed to then observe one another as military activities, essentially, uh, through unarmed flyovers. I know that's a huge generalization. There are, of course, details within it which are important. The U.S. has, for 
a significant time now, as well as a number of other countries within the treaty, accused Russia of not honoring its side of the agreement and treaty. Uh, and that is why the U.S. Uh, has walked away from this. What does this then mean for trust when it comes to these militaries? What does it mean to arms control efforts around the world? Um, there's a lot of issues, of course, uh, at stake here. Let's discuss all of that a bit further. And I'm joined by Dr. Hall Gardner, who is a professor at the Department of International and Comparative Politics at the American University of Paris. He is joining us today from the French capital. Hall, thank you very much for your time. Uh, how did you react to the U.S. now being formally out of the Open Skies Treaty? Pretty negatively. I think it's a very dangerous move. I think it's a continuation of a trend uh, since really the Bush administration when it dropped out of the ABM Treaty back in 2001. Um, we are, uh, just let me go down the list, the, 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 the Conventional Force in Europe Treaty is basically uh, null, it, it doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, the, uh, the Trump administration itself uh, dropped out of the 1987 Intermediate Range uh, Nuclear Force Treaty, the INF Treaty. This was the treaty that helped bring the U.S. and Soviet Union into cooperation, and now we've dumped that, and the U.S. is now permitted to put land-based missiles anywhere they want to. Uh, and this is just one more step in undermining a whole series of, uh, of multilateral agreements. Mm. It will have impact on nuclear non-proliferation treaty and other, other indirectly. Um, the, the, the inter, all these interacting. Uh, uh, treaties that have been dropped uh, will uh, really harm, uh, make it more difficult for the Biden administration to engage in multilateral treaties. Mm. Now, uh, uh, if, I, if, I may, if, if, I, if I may come in for a moment, uh, how would you respond, though, to the accusation about Russia, right, not respecting its, its part of the treaty? Because that's been the bone of contention for the U.S., and especially for the Trump administration, vis-a-vis -vis other treaties as well. So it's not like this is the first one. We also had the START um, uh, treaty issue, and, and I, I believe there's been one other as well, where the U.S. keeps saying that Russia's the one not honoring its side of the agreement, so we're walking away from it this because of that. Really, on both sides here, I think both sides are, are uh, violating uh, uh, the um, ABM treaty. Uh, the United, Russia was constantly accusing the United States of deploying missile defenses that could be used uh, to uh, uh, shoot down intercontinental ballistic missiles. The United States said that was baloney. We weren't. They weren't doing that. And just this past week or so, they've tested a part of the uh, missile defense system that can shoot down an IV, ICBM. Um, the United States had a uh, had a um, intermediate range missile in the works. Uh, it tested it almost immediately after it dropped out of the INF treaty. So uh, now, granted, the, this doesn't mean the Russians aren't aren't uh, doing the uh, aren't violating these treaties as well. They they had a, a missile intermediate range missile that was uh, to the limits of the of the uh, of the. INF treaty. Uh, and in, in terms of the uh, Open Skies Agreement, yes, the Russians have per not permitted uh, the uh, U.S. And, and NATO allies to overlook uh, the, uh, the um, Kal Kaliningrad border or the uh, borders around Georgia, uh, Abkhazia. So, so both sides have been uh, really uh, on the brink of breaking uh, these treaties. And the problem is for the Biden administration to, to try to uh, prevent Humpty Dumpty from uh, put Humpty Dumpty back together again mm. uh, in its new professed multilateralism. Mm. All right, so then what, okay, fine. When, when Biden comes in, though, into office officially, of course, I mean, he takes over. Um, he needs to build bridges once again. Is, is, that, is that what the goal is going to be? Is it almost too late in some regards to do that when it comes to certain um, possible treaties or, or agreements? Because, I mean, I imagine it's not that easy to just walk in and walk out as per your, your wishes. No, no. The first thing Biden's got to do, at least on the arms control front, is at least uh, uh, stall the uh, the um, start agreement is to expire February 2021. So the first thing they've got to do, if they, they can't re redo the whole treaty in that short amount of time, but they can at least po postpone a decision and, and try to uh, uh, re redo the treaty later on so they can at least uh, um, uh, keep that going while they begin these negotiations will not will not be easy because these negotiations have to do with with NATO uh, they have to do with NATO deployments in in Eastern Europe the NATO Russia founding act is is almost dead they, they need to re, re uh, restructure their relationship 
really from ground one if they're going to reset relations again. They tried it in 2008 and failed. Uh, in, in China, the issue of Chinese, um, one of the reasons the United States went out of the um, intermediate range uh, INF treaty uh, was ch uh, China is not a part of that treaty, and yet it's China that's developing these uh, intermediate range systems. Um, so the open, the, get back to the, the key point, the open skies was a way to overlook all of this and to get all sides knowing what they were doing. But if we don't know, now, the U.S. will use its satellites to observe Russia, and they're, they're very effective, but that cuts the allies off. And in fact, uh, um, air flights are, can be uh, actually more, uh, uh, can, can learn more from air flights uh, than necessarily from satellites. So, hmm. so maintaining this treaty, in my view, is absolutely crucial to an overall arching approach to preventing a new global arms race. Hmm. Okay, so then, so what happens now, right? Because then the, the, there are concerns about what exactly, and I know you've alluded to this a lot uh, in your earlier answers as well, but uh, let's say that the, now the U.S. has walked away, what's to say that the other nations will not just say, okay, the U.S. is this huge, huge superpower. It has this humongous military, and if it's not going to respect this treaty and walk away from it, then um, why shouldn't we as well? I mean, it, it's a, it becomes a free-for-all in a sense, doesn't it? I, I, they don't have the capabilities. Uh, that's part of the problem. Um, they don't have the uh, uh, the satellite capabilities to do what the United States does. So, in fact, the U U.S. is abandoning its allies by doing this because the Open Skies Agreement allowed allies to participate in 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 the agreement. And the Russians are even saying, uh, well, "Well, we'll let you uh, continue, but we, you can't uh, tell the, the Americans what you're what you're uh, uh, doing." So. Uh, um, they won't. They don't want uh, the sh Russia doesn't want uh, uh, NATO to share uh, NATO allies to share uh, information with, with the Americans. So this is a way to try to draw the Europeans cl closer to the to the Russians. So uh, uh, and and the Russians are still going to do the surveillance. So we, we're really in a in a in a, a, a very um, what I would say a game that's very dangerous uh, and can only be overcome if the United States. Working with the Europeans begins a new rapprochement with Russia in, in, in particular, and, and likewise reaches a common strategy with China uh, in regard to intermediate range missiles. All right, so then final thought then, then Hall. Do, do you think that um, uh, the Biden administration in, in many ways, and I'm going back to that because, of course, that's where we're going to see the future happening. Um, do you think it will be able to um, make the world a safer place? Because, you know, uh, whether we're not, we like Trump, there, there is that narrative at least now being sold to, to some of us that it, at least Trump didn't start any new wars. Uh, is that his crowning achievement in a sense? He's KK close. Uh, if he had got, if he had total control of his, his own military, wasn't against some of his uh, policies in regard to Syria and elsewhere, and maybe Iran, and, and not too, not too, uh, too long from now, uh, we won't, he, he will not have created a, a, a war. I mean, I called, a, I wrote a book, World War Trump, but it's because the dynamics of are getting worse. We, we are in a new arms race, and Biden will have a hard time pulling back from that arms race. Both Democrats and Republicans supported the, the de defense authorization mm. bills that are the highest in American and world history. Uh, we, we aren't turning, the, the Democrats are just as responsible as Republicans for, for the, the, the state of the world as it is. Right. And uh, we really need right. a, intense, and go, intense negotiations with Russia. And ideological concerns about democracy uh, and uh, this that the Biden administration is pushing will limit our ability to Okay, we seem to have some audio days there, Hall. We'll leave it there for now, though. We sin sincerely, of course, appreciate your taking our time out of a busy schedule to speak to us today here in Scope. That was Dr. Hall Gardner speaking to us from Paris, sharing his thoughts on the U.S. walking away from the Open Skies Treaty, a vital treaty, because you know, it's not like it was just the U.S. within the treaty, 34 other participating nations, all to keep an eye and to keep that trust ongoing between different nations around the world about military activities, allowing for unarmed surveillance flights uh, over each other's territories. Will this now be a free-for-all, as I'd put to Hall? Will President like Biden be able to walk all of this back? Because it's not like the only treaty that the U.S. has walked away from to do with arms control and to keep uh, respective militaries in check. That is, of course, of concern and should be of concern to every world citizen also.
I'll leave her there for now. I've been Wakar Rizvi. Thanks for watching.